Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Boris. Today we'll be learning how to draw tiles in the Kashan style. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to make the actual tiles themselves uh, because we only have a, a few hours. So what we're going to learn instead of making is the drawing technique they used to uh, apply the luster uh, onto the surface of the tile. Um, so we'll be making our own tiles, but out of paper. Uh, and then at the end, hopefully, we'll have enough tiles to put together. We'll have a nice big panel uh, of star and cross uh, tiles. Uh, I've got some samples here of my own work. If any of you are interested in the, in, in the technique and how, how it works when it's actually applied, then please come up to the front and have a look. Uh, and hopefully that will get you inspired. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we're going to be looking at the, uh, uh, at the drawing techniques. Uh, today we're going to, we're going to focus on uh, the we're going to be looking at uh, the more of the figurative work, so the animals, the vegetal motifs, and uh, the human figure. And then in the session after uh, later on, we'll be focusing more on the kind of geometric patterns, the arabesque patterns, but uh, using a bit of uh, geometry. So, uh, to start off, first of all, we're going to uh, draw a template uh, of the eight-pointed star. It's a very simple um, template. So, yeah, if you get your A3 paper and just fold it, fold it very accurately in half, this way, a nice straight line down the middle. And then another one vertically. Again, make sure the, the corners, make sure it's accurate so the corners, <coughs> the corners uh, match up. So what you should end up with is uh, the cross, like that. And that's just to get the, the horizontal and the vertical line. So you should end up with something like this. And that's to get them. Yeah? OK, so now we're going to create our eight-pointed star. So we get our compass uh, uh, and set it to eight point. Uh, 8.2 centimetres. 8.2. That's just going to give us our template. It's the same size. We'll be making the, the, the end result will be a tile that's about this uh, a shape that's, that's going to be about this size. And then what we're going to do is put the point in the centre of the the page, enjoy your first circle Give it around the centre like that. Once you've finished that, you can, you can draw your first square. So if you join up where they, the edges link to the line, you'll get your, sorry, my job is not good, but that will get you your, your first square. So where the the circle meets the horizontal and the vertical line. If you um, connect those up, you'll get your first, uh, your first square. And for those of you who know about geometry, now we have to get the other square. So we're going to uh, place our compass point on the points of the square and draw other circles. So you're going to have... Same. same, yeah, same, same, um, don't change your compass at all. And so you're placing it on these, you're placing it on these points of the, of the circle. Yeah, that's fine, it, 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 it'll go off the edge on either side, that's fine, you don't need that part on the four points. It, it, uh, you'll find it goes over the edge on the, the narrow points of the of the paper, but that's no problem because we're not um, we're not going to be using that. Yeah. 
And we're doing this to get their diagonals. Uh, so once you've... And then we're, what we're going to do is going to get their diagonals. So the points here where the circles intersect, uh, here and here, we're going to draw a straight line between the two. So between the points where the, where the, the, the outer circles intersect here. Between the two. And then next we're going to draw the line across to get our eight pointed star. So, uh, so it's this line that goes across. It's not very up. It's this line that goes across and meets there. Pointed star. Yeah. So it's it's. Uh, uh, so what you're going to end up is something like this. So it's where the circle, and that's going to be your temp. That'll be your template. That's the only bit of geometry we'd, we'd, we're doing today. Uh, we can also now that we've got the, uh, the star, we can we can make the, the cross out of it as well. So uh, we've got the. We've got the eight-pointed star there. You join up these two points and these two points. So here and here and here, where they meet there. Then you get the then you get the cross in the centre of the, the tile. Uh, and this is, this will be our template for the for the pattern. Uh, no, no. We, we just we just need the uh, the eight pointed star and the cross. That's all we need. And these two points are there. Uh, yeah, that's great. So now we go we draw a diagonal between these two points here. Yeah. And then from here. And then we go from this point to this point with the ruler, and then yeah, and that will get you our that will get you the the, the star. Do you want some help? Okay. Can I just sorry? I just need to get by here. So the cross is going from here to the here, here to there. So here to there. Yeah. If you outline the star now in um, uh, the pen, if we ever did ever can bring the pens or thicker pencil so we can see, and then we're going to trace trace the star over the top. Yeah, just the star. With our tracing paper, yeah. So you just trace down the star with tracing paper. Then we'll be ready. So if we trace round the if we trace round the uh, design uh, or tracing paper, then we'll be ready to begin the fun part, the drawing. Uh, drawing by hand. Drawing by hand. It's all be drawn by hand. The the uh, the cash and potters are uh, drawing by hand. They work very fast, very fluently, and. Uh, Irregularly, so they, they make a mistake, it's no problem. So don't worry, the whole point of exercise is to develop a fluid drawing style. So if you make a mistake when you're drawing a figure, then then uh, don't worry. Uh, if the figures look a bit strange, that's good because in this particular style, a lot of the you're not trying to create a representative figure. It's more the essence of the figure. So. Uh, So what we're, what we're doing here really is just we've got the shape, which is what the the potters would have been faced with, except theirs would have been a tile, like you see here. So uh, once you're faced with a tile, you have to decide how to fill it with the pattern, with the figures, and this is what the the Kashan potters were masters of. They left no 
space unfilled, you have this lovely harmonious composition, with the figures seated under this tree, the fish pond at the bottom, uh, and these lovely kind of vegetal, vegetal sprays of foliage uh, uh, going around uh, in the background. Uh, again, it's not a representative. We're not trying to get something that's representative. Let's get something that looks like a photo. It's very cartoony, very flat. The figures are all out of proportion. The heads are too big. <laughs> if they, so don't worry if, if, uh, if, you, if your figure looks, looks funny. It has to look funny to work. If it doesn't look funny, it's not going to work. So what we'll do is to start off the drawing. We will just start off by creating the, the pool and the two sweet little fish inside the pool. So if you've got your um, tracing paper, you just do a little line over the top. You have to do the same. If you want to do the same. This is, this is to get people, this is to, uh, uh, see, to get you into the mood. If you have any creative ideas, I would encourage you to, to do whatever you like. Uh, so this is really just to, to familiarize yourself with the style and the uh, technique of how, they, of how the, the potters work. Yeah, so let's just, and then let's start off by drawing this little, uh, simple little fish in the centre. You add your detail, little dots. You want to use a bit of the blue crayon, use the blue crayon it to fill up the space as well. What we're doing is just, yeah, just getting used to the mark making, how they made their marks. So you can see the fish is very, it's, 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 it's very uh, kind of rough. No, it's not symmetrical, but it has interesting, you have these interesting patterns, like the hexagons, these kind of squashed hexagons on one side in blue, coming out of the pattern of the, of the, uh, of the ropes. And here you have the circles. Mm -hmm. So you have the different. Yeah, yeah. So what we're doing now is just going to, we're just going to have a look and just get ourselves in the, the mind of the potter and get used to the mark making that they made. Every drawing technique, every decorating technique has its own way of, uh, uh, of mark making. So. Yeah, there is, and it's always, this is a very common motif. You'll find this a lot with the tiles, this composition of the figure, of the tree, sitting under the tree, maybe it's the tree of life, we don't know, and then you have all these kind of lovely, uh, these lovely kind of foliage uh, kind of coming out of it. So it's, it's a very common image, you'll find this a lot in, in, on, on the tiles. So what we'd, what, so after we've done the fish, we can then, you know, start to create this loop at the top here. So let's just fill that in. And you've got this, it's almost like a curtain, isn't it? The coming down from the, from the top. These, you know, like a scene from a play. Uh, so we're just going to yeah, bring those down. You've got these three little... Three, three, three little eyes in the centre. Um, and then you can fill in the, the gaps with this. This is very common, these little squiggles or curly cues, as we call them, the very common motif. Every, every sp available space in the tile, if it, was left, if it was blank, they would fill with these, this, these little motifs. So uh, we're going to fill those in with the, the little squiggles. Here. Again, don't worry if it's not 100% accurate. The only one that's going to be quite difficult to do is these very fine little white lines, but I, I might just leave those uh, in with the, with the black. So, and you can always use the crayons to colour in the blue uh, 
underneath the fish. Um, and then we can build, start building the central composition. So let's uh, start with. We can start with the head. The head's the head start at the intersect of this star. So just going to build the halo that goes around the top. The pencil, then you can work a bit more freely and then you can go over it in the pen afterwards. So don't worry about... It looks a bit funny. Uh, and then you have this... I don't know if you can see it, this lovely bird sitting in the tree. Uh, very slim, elegant kind of looking bird. So we're just going to draw that. Make a bit little beak. And then a little head. Uh, you can see there, and you have these kind of curve. They look like rips or branches, maybe. I don't quite know what they're supposed to represent. But we can put those in. Other squiggles as well. Sketch out the halo first. It's like a very round. They seem to intersect on oh, oh, this intersection here. So, so I, would, I, would, I would draw like a circle, one particular element of the design. So if you, if you get the outline, build the outline first. Again, use a, a loose hand because we can go over it. We'll go over it with the ink once it's with a pen. If everyone's got the pen, once it's um, once we're finished. Yeah, they're the bird. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the bird. Yeah, it's sitting in the tree. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing about the Kashan tiles is that when you when you start looking, you see things that that you you won't notice at first. But when you're when you really study the tile, then you get these lovely um, details and surprises. I think so. I mean, nobody knows exactly what they the spirituality behind and what they were supposed to represent. I imagine so. It has that calm, it's a very, it has a kind of very calm feel to it. Uh, it's almost as if they are kind of praying or meditating under the, under the tree. And, and the halos are normally considered to express uh, a high rank, so maybe a couple. No, there's lots of, you know, there's, there's, there's a definite yeah, s a sense of that you get from looking at these tiles. Uh, and I think part of the, yeah, the mystery of them is trying to, trying to kind of understand and work out you know, the, sim the symbolic nature of the tile, because there's, there's obviously deep symbolism in there, uh, which, we, which, which uh, we can relate to. The what? Uh, afterwards, I would uh, I would do it with a pen, and, the, and you can you can put the blue in with the with the crayons, and then we're going to cut round the then we're going to cut round the tile with our scissors, and then we're going to do the cross, and then we're going to put all the tiles the crosses together to make a big panel on the one of the tables. So we'll see we'll have our own Kashan style tile panel. You can do whatever you want. Anything you want. I mean. That's what I'll be teaching here, but feel free if you want to do your own style or your own methods, then I, I would be very happy that you do that. It's really to teach, uh, I'm really teaching the style and the way they, they, they made their marks rather than the actual kind of compositional um, structure. Uh, so yeah, I would encourage everyone, you know, if you want to put in your own details, I would very much encourage that, your own animals, your own birds. Um, uh, then please feel free. Uh, for those of you that are doing your own compositions, I do have a very wide range of source material here. So if you did want to put any like birds or any any other animals, then uh, feel free to do that. Uh, I'll leave them here, and you can uh, leave those and take. There's lots of different. There's lots of different. Yeah, they're all different. So you've got lots of different source material there. Uh, the face, how they draw the faces, is very common in Kashan tiles. This, this, this uh, kind of very uh, uh, rounded 
features. Almost like moon, the moon. And then you can also sketch out the kind of hexagon, this kind of squashed hexagons that are. Uh, The blue that you see on the tiles is would have been done before before the decoration. So the blue that you see on the, all these tiles, they would have done on the first firing. So this is the, t the tile of two firings. The first firing is done with the white glaze. In this case, they would have put this blue on first and fired that first, and then they'd have decorated around the blue. So you you get the white pure white tile with this blue border, these blue circles, and they would have used that as the guide for the composition. So they probably knew that the, 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 the potters that were making this would have known uh, what composition they were going to put onto it before the tile, uh, before the tile was fired. On the outside, the blue around the outside of this halo here, and we've got the blue going around. Here, here, and then round here. Uh, and you have a little bit of turquoise you can see in the middle there. Uh, again, that's quite common with the Kashan style tiles. It's, it's, it's uh, blue, the turquoise, and the copper luster is, is the main, uh, of the main. Uh, colours the palette that they used. So what we're doing is just going to just going to apply little blobs of colour. So for me the perfect the eight pointed star is the perfect geometric construction uh, for this type of composition. Uh, there's something about uh, and this method of uh, uh, of painting and decorating. Uh, it doesn't work so well on the square shape, but with the eight-pointed star you get that, that harmony, uh, the total harmony of, of colour, shade, uh, light. About, about this kind of colour part as well, it's very limited, so it forces you to just think about the mark making rather than the, what colours you use. As soon as you have more colours, things get a lot more difficult <laughs> because you have to choose what colour is going to go where, what colour would work in, um, uh, in, in certain areas, whereas here you just have the, the copper and the blue. So it's very, it's good because it limits, limits you just to that particular um, uh, those particular kind of colours, so you, you, yeah, you're not wasting time trying to decide kind of what colours to use. Blue in, in this one, uh, I, I use a lot of different colours. I use well, generally I use the gold to, to luster, and then uh, depending on what tiles I'm using, uh, will uh, but I find with the gold it's a very uh, it works best with very strong colours. So, for example, uh, you know the very strong, the very strong blues. It's a very perfect, or very strong greens. That the richer and the stronger the green, the more intense, uh, uh, the better. I mean, you're welcome to have a look at those. Is it made gold. The go it's made of real gold. Yeah. So. Uh, it, it, it's cooked in the oven, so to temperatures of 700 degrees. Why do you call it cooked in the oven, fired in the oven? I could call it fired in the oven, cooked in the oven. It doesn't really... Are you going to show us the difference? 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 Yes. Yeah, the green. The, it takes... It, it, it's, I, I've done it for a process called vitreous lustre, so I use a lot of glass with these tiles. And I'm taking advantage of the fact that the tile is a flat, um, it's a flat object. So you can put a lot of glaze on it and it's not going to run off the glaze. This technique does not work for pots or bowls because 
you put this amount of glaze on a pot or bowl, it will just fall off the glaze, uh, fall off the side and onto the kiln shelf or into the middle of the bowl. So it only works, it only works with tiles. So it's a surprise. So it's a surprise, yeah. So I don't know how it's going to turn out. None of my tiles I make, I know how they're going to turn out. For me, the process uh, re reveals itself to the process. So I start off, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, how it's going to look, what colour it's going to be. It's only by doing it, uh, so uh, only by uh, painting that, that it reveals itself. And even then, it looks very different uh, now to how it looked when I put it in the kiln. So the colours, it, it looks very different because when you apply it, it doesn't look gold. It looks uh, a very dark brown and it doesn't smell very nice. And, it, and it's very sticky and it... And then, but when it comes out, it kind of magically transforms into this beautiful gold colour. And, and the same with the background. I never know how, it, how it's going to come out. Uh, because I put a lot of glass, that swells everything around. So uh, uh, this kind of, this, these kind of uh, swirly, almost like clouds in the background, they happen by accident. So you put it in and so sometimes they work. That's by accident, yeah. Sometimes that the best things for me, it has to, you have to have that. That has to be part of the process, is the accident and not knowing how it's going to come out of the kiln. I do, but even I don't even now. I do not know how they're going to turn out. That's why it's very exciting, <laughs> because you never know. You open the kiln, and sometimes your heart lifts, and sometimes you start crying. And uh, especially, uh, it's a very time-consuming process, so sometimes you spend four or five days on one tile, you put it in the kiln, you open it up, and the tile is broken. So, but you, have, you learn to live with that. You know, you, you, for me, it's about the process, not about the finished result. It's not about... Uh, yeah, it's about experiments. For me, it's the process of experimentation yeah. and being happy with the way of working, not about trying to make a great work of art every time. It's... It's being happy, and that's what I'm hoping to show here, is just the way of working and the process and, and for you to enjoy the process, because that's, that's the most important thing, in, in my opinion. No, these ones, are used, these ones are used on the wall, and they're, they're mainly used in shrines or tombs. So there's a strong funerary association with these tiles. They're, out of all the religious buildings that are used for, I think 18 were, 18 were tombs to, or shrines, you had two tombs, and then um, only two were used in mosques. So they were very, yeah, they had that, that, that's, that was their kind of purpose. And yours on the floor? My, my, mine's at the moment, they're on the floor. I'm making them, I haven't, I make ones a lot bigger. So uh, each eight-pointed star that I make is probably about this big and this wide and very thick. So I'm assembling a big wall of tiles. Uh, at the moment, uh, when it's ready, it'll go on the wall. But at the moment, they're just lying on the, the on the floor uh, uh, until I finish it. Then I will I'll put it on a on a wall. I think so. Yeah, I hope so. I don't know where they're going to go. For me, it's I haven't. I'm just making it because I enjoy making it. I haven't decided, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen once I've, I've finished it. Yeah, yeah. The most interesting thing is always the ones where you don't know what's going to happen. I'm a, a great believer in that. So the experiments, uh, you know, it's, if, you, if you work in ceramics, I always say, you know, you always want to be experimenting every time and learning every time. It's very important to learn, learn, experiment, uh, and, and don't worry about making mistakes. Making mistakes is the only way you, is the only way we, we learn. Uh, yeah, so you can also do these little, uh, kind of these little vegetal motifs and flowers. This is a very common motif. This you can see here with the, the slender stems. The only kind of technique in this that we can't reproduce here is the bits, the bits in between the gap, because these are very fine. And what, what, what would have happened is they would have put the pigment on and scratched these, these marks out of the pigment. So, but you can kind of, you can get 
you can get that effect by just squiggling and just colouring it in. So you, you can get a feel for the for the for the kind of patterns that, that, that go around it. Uh, oh. the uh, this is scratched before the firing. No, before. So it's like it's a pigment. So it's like a yeah, kind of a thick a thick paint, but it comes off quite easily. So they'll take a very fine a very fine point. And I've, I've got one of these, almost like a, a pencil or a compass point, and just scratch very gently to expose the glaze underneath. So it's applied using a mixture of, uh, of like a pen that they dip in the pigment to get the, uh, to get the outlines for the main composition. And then they would fill in the, the whole of this area with the, that you see here with the pigment. And then scratch away with a point. Uh, with a knife, or very, it's like a compass point, like a very sharp, st uh, almost like a s skewer, uh, and then that exposed the the white underneath. So it's a very, yeah, it's, it's very ingenious. And then these these lines would have been applied using just a, a pen, they'd dip in the pigment and, and to create these squiggles. Cause these you can see with the with the, with the luster on the top. So it's a mixture of different, it's a mixture of different techniques. Um, for, for my tiles, I put the resist over. With the, with this gold luster is different to the pigment. Uh, it's a lot more sticky. You can't scratch through the the surface of the luster when you apply it. So what I do is cover the whole tile in white paint, uh, a thin layer of white paint, and then scratch through with again a scribe and do the whole. It's, it's a process called scraffito. We call it, and it and it. Um, uh, uh, I just scratched the whole the whole uh, tile with with the scribe to get the pattern, and then cover. Once I've got the pattern, I cover the whole tile with the gold paint, the luster, and then it only sticks to the areas that are exposed. Any areas that aren't exposed uh, just get burnt off. Yeah, it's like making an, it's like exactly it's like making a negative image. Uh, so like 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 printmaking. So it's a different, is it, uh, because uh, I don't w work with the pigments, I work with the gold, and you can't get gold in a pigment um, format. It um, no one's invented it yet, so you have to work in a different, I have to work in a different method. But originally, that's, that's the method they would have, that's the method they would have done. This is gold, yeah. This is ceramic and glass. They're both glass. They're both glass. They're both vitreous uh, glazes. Those ones, and that one, one at the top's got cobalt. The the dark blue with cobalt, and then put a layer of turquoise glass over the whole tile. First is the cobalt underneath the glass. Yeah. And then I put turquoise glass over the whole tile. Yeah. Okay, and then on the glass, yeah. you and then that's fired once, and then it comes out with the blues, of the turquoise, and the cobalt, uh, and then you decorate it, and then you fire it again. Why is the white? It's white. I don't know. A happy accident. Uh, that happens uh, when you experiment. You get. I think it's when, when the glaze drops, when the glass melts, melts down, yes, exactly. then it exposes the edge. The yeah, so you get that nice kind of white line along did the you, edge. Did you, did you two print considering the temperature, the entry point yeah. of the uh, glass to the glass and the Yeah, I'm not sure what temperature. I mean, I, I fire those to stoneware temperatures, which means they're very high fired. So a tunnel like this would have been fired to temperatures of 1,000 degrees. 1, degrees. Yeah. Once fired to 1,000 degrees. Th yeah, that one, that, that tile is fired to 1,235 degrees. So very, very hot. And 35 degrees. In the oven? Uh, in the oven, yeah. And what is the second time? The second time uh, is uh, 700 degrees. So very hot. I just fire it up and then and then down again. So the firing schedule, the, the firing schedule will be about uh, 
I'll, I'll put it on, if I'm lust doing it, I'll put it on at night, so about five o'clock or before I go home, and it'll be ready in the morning. So kind of uh, 12, 14 hours, I would say. Slow cooking. Yeah, it's phase, well, it takes a long time to get to temperature. You can't, you can't fire with ceramics, especially the first firing, but also on the, on the second firing, you have to fire it slowly. It's not, it's not good to fire it very fast because uh, the, the, the tile then can, can break because of the, the quick change in temperature. So uh, you want to bring it up slow, as, sl you know, as slowly as possible. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can run into some problems. Yeah, yeah, then we're going to cut them out and do the cross and then we're going to put them on the exhibition and sell them for thousands of pounds. Yeah. Thousands of uh, dollars. <laughs> for, for traditional tile, is 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 kind of red colour. There's this, this brown, yeah, it's, it's like a metallic. I mean, yeah, red, blue, and turquoise are the three colours. You can probably see a little bit of turquoise in there. So they're the three main colours they would use. No, just those three ones. So it's it's all about the the composition and the black, the black and the white, so the contrast. So when you're when you're you're not trying to get uh, an impre yeah, you're, you're using the the very contrasting colours to 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 do the composition. Yeah, the, go the, the copper. I use the gold. They hadn't invented gold luster in the 13th century, so they used copper. But it was actually a copper, uh, a copper compound mixed with silver, and lots of other ingredients like arsenic, and vinegar, and other things. It's, there's about nine different. They're, they're basically uh, variants of copper and silver compounds. And then the more copper you had, the redder it, the redder it became. The more silver you had, the more uh, I think the gold, the more gold it was. Of, um, so what we're going to do is the cross. Uh, if you don't worry, if you don't want to do the calligraphy, I'll just be focusing on the design in the middle. So uh, don't worry if you don't, if you don't want to do the right around the outside. This is a lovely looping spiraling design, uh, which I'll be teaching now. But again, if you want to, all those that want to pursue their own designs, I have a list of like cross tiles here if you want to um, to do something different or if you want to, to put your own if you have your own ideas that you want to to, to do you can do that uh, but we'll be focusing and I'll be focusing on drawing this lovely uh, floral motif that will complement the the star tile perfectly uh, I won't be doing the calligraphy I'll just be focusing on the the inside of the tile so, you have with these is this lovely double loop on each section. So uh, we could just draw, maybe draw that first. So very graceful, a very graceful movement with the with the pen to get that lovely that lovely flow. And what I do is just, uh, yeah, just with a, a light pencil, just trace around it lightly. So what we're going to do, yeah, so once we've, once we've traced the outline, work on the details of the leaves. No, I don't use the, no, I don't use the paper transfer. Everything's done by hand. Uh, so it's about so that's why we're trying to learn these skills here, so you can transfer these skills. So it's learning how to draw in the manner that they drew then, and to draw freely. And that will help you then if you're doing your own compositions and you want to paint. Then you know by learning from the from the best, which these, in my opinion these guys were, you can yeah you, know, you can get a real it'll improve your own practice as artists. Um, and you can apply this not just tiles but fabrics, uh, any uh, paint. What we're also learning is how they represented leaves and uh, the plants and the natural forms and these kind of shapes they used aren't visual uh, representations of 
representations. I think you have to free, but I think that's a good thing. That's, that's what I'm trying to encourage, that kind of... The way I my work is, first of all, in a very rough and ready way, and then you apply the detail afterwards. So rather than starting off with the detail, you start off with the big, the big uh, kind of brush marks or pencil marks of the flowing, to get that flow and make it more kind of natural and spontaneous. And then once you've got the main composition, then you can start then kind of focusing on the detail and... Uh, okay, brilliant. Can I see? Very nice. Yeah, I like it. Very good. The same size. Yeah, uh, yeah. so we're going to put them, once we finish, we'll lay them all out onto a table so they all fit in together. So we'll have a big panel to, to photograph. So if you cut that, yeah, with the scissors. Yeah, well, it's trying to kind of, you know, I want it to reflect my own practice as well, not just a copy and what's done before, but to have something that's, you know, comes from within me and inspires me as, a, as an artist. I think that's important, not just, a, you know, it's great. I like, copying is brilliant and it's very good to learn, which is what we're doing now. Uh, but then once you've learnt those skills, then as an artist, you have to kind of apply that to your own, to your own work. You know, so that's very important. And for me, yeah, it's using poetry that's not contemporary because this is probably written a hundred years ago. Or that's something that really relates for me and that relates to the image. And you know, it's an important part. Um, that, that's not, yeah. I mean, with this one, it will fit. This will all fit in together. So that one should fit in like that. You see. So what we're going to do is combine the. So we're going to combine everybody's together. So once you're finished, we'll put them all together on the, and then we'll have a lovely, we'll have a lovely work of art that we then, uh, we can then photograph of everyone's pieces as like a group to show what we can achieve as a group. So that's the, uh, and I think it's similar, I mean, you get the similar, those figures are very similar, that, that idea of the figures in a garden, like almost like an enchanted garden with the, with the tree and the fish, that's a very, uh, fish, yeah, it's a different scene, but the figures tend to be very similar, so they all look, they all look the same way, but the face is generally painted the same way, the, the, so it's not, they're not, I think there's, it's in my book there, but uh, there are, I mean, there are, there are, you know, there are designs for use in shrines and tombs, and they would, the whole wall would be covered. You have the, and then over the centuries, people realised how valuable they were. So a lot of them were ripped down and sold. So now most of them are in the collections and museums around the world. And just pieces, you'll get ones coming, old ones coming up for sale. And the, 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 some museums have got nice, very nice panels of them. But the, where they were originally, there's just a blank wall. And it's a real, it's a shame. But what happened was over, you know, people realised how valuable they were, and either they were ripped down or sold. Some of the mihrabs that were um, uh, were in the shrines were taken down uh, uh, and and sold uh, to you know rich uh, merchants who then sold them on to the, to Europe, mainly in America. Uh, so you had you had a lot. So a lot of the a lot of the tiles, I mean, there are, there's still a lot that remain in Iran, but a lot of them, a, a lot, you know, some of the best work was taken and sold. Yeah, 12th century is, is, is the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th was considered the height. Uh, the Seljuks, yeah, it's the Seljuks. Yeah, the Seljuks are the... the, 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 the Lustre was, invent, was invented in Iraq, or that's where the first piece of lustre pottery we see. Afterwards, they, the potters seem to have migrated to Egypt and the Fatimids, and then the Fatimid dynasty collapsed. And then we assume the potters who were living in Egypt at the time moved, and then uh, uh, you had the, uh, then under the Seljuk in Kashan, then you had this great flowering of, of lustre, and that's when the great lustre 
vessels and tiles were made. And then for about, about 1220, I think the Mongols invaded. And then lustreware production effectively ceased for about 40 years until about 1260, 1265 under the Orokhanids. And then uh, that's, and then we saw the second break of output of, of lustreware that lasted until the, the beginning of the 14th century. So the original ones are in which museum? Well, there's lots of different, they're, they're all over the place. I mean, there, there are lots of, I mean, there are some original Kashan tiles in the, I saw a few in the, the Museum of Islamic Art here. Yes, but the R tiles are in Konya, in yeah. other museums. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're probably, there are lots of, the, the Louvre has got, Victoria, Albert, yeah, Albert. there's, yeah, British Museum, there's a panel of, of beautiful Kashan tiles in the, the Louvre, in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Uh, there are lots of, uh, I mean, they're, they're made in quite a, a, a large quantity, so there are quite a lot of them, uh, a lot of them kind of around. And, and some of them, a lot of them come up for auction as well, but the, the, kind of the better pieces, generally speaking, are in the, muse are in the museums uh, 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 that you see. Once we finish doing the style and then we'll put the other piles together.